A Tale of Magic, Chapter 6, The Bootstrap Correctional Facility for Troubled Young Women. By sunrise, Bristol was already so far from Chariot Hills, she couldn't hear the morning cathedral bells. She was shackled in the back of a small carriage that traveled down a long and bumpy road through the northeast plains of the southern kingdom. True to its name, there was absolutely nothing to see in the plains but the same flat earth that stretched for miles around them. With every passing hour, the grassy land became drier and drier, and the sky became grayer and grayer, until land and sky blended into the dismal color into one dismal color. The drivers stopped only rarely to feed the horses, and occasionally the guards let Bristol out of the carriage to relieve herself on the side of the road. The only food they gave her was a piece of stale bread, and Bristol was afraid to eat it because she didn't know how long she was supposed to ration it. The drivers said nothing ab about an estimated time of arrival, so their second day of travel began. So as their second day of travel began, she started worrying their destination didn't exist. She convinced herself that the carriage would eventually pull over and the drivers would abandon her in the middle of nowhere. Perhaps that was what her father and the High Justice's plan had been all along. In the late afternoon of their second day, Bristol finally spotted something in the distance that suggested there was a, there was civilization nearby. Civilization nearby. As the carriage moved closer to the object, she saw it was a wooden sign that pointed down a new path. The bootstrap correctional facility for troubled young women. The carriage turned into a dirt road, heading in the direction the sign pointed to. Bristol re was relieved to see their destination existed, but as the facility appeared on the horizon, she realized being abandoned might have been a, a better option. Bristol had never laid eyes on such a miserable place, and just the sight of it sucked all the remaining hope and happiness from her body. The bootstrap correctional facility for troubled young woman sat on top of the only hill Bristol had seen in the, in the Northeast Plains. It was a wide five-story building made from crumbling bricks. The walls were severely weathered and cracked, severely weathered and cracked, and all the windows were tiny, covered in bars, and the glass was mostly shattered. There were gaping holes in the thatched roof, and a crooked chimney in the center made the whole facility look like an enormous rotting pumpkin. The building was surrounded by a few acres of parched land, and the property was boarded, bordered by a stone wall with sharp spikes along the top. Bristol's carriage stopped at the facility's gate, and the driver whistled for a hunchbacked gatekeeper, who limped out from his small post and removed the barriers. Once the gate was open, the carriage continued down a path that sneaked through the facility's grounds. Everywhere she looked, Bristol saw dozens of young women between the ages of about eight and 17 sprinkled across the property. Each girl wore a faded gray and black striped dress, a, a, bandana, a bandana to keep the hair out of her face, and a pair of oversized work boots. All the young women were pale and emaciated and shared the same expression of utter exhaustion as if they hadn't had a decent meal or a good night's rest in years. It was a haunting sight and Bristol wondered how long it would be until she, like the other girls, resembled a ghost of her former self. The young women were separated into groups performing various chores. Some fed chickens in, overcro in an overcrowded coop. Some milked malnourished cows in a small Pen, garden in a small pen, and some pulled wilted vegetables from a withering garden. However, Bristol didn't understand the point of the other activities she saw the girls performing. Some dug large holes in the ground with shovels, some moved heavy stones back and forth from one pile to another, and some carried heavy buckets of water around in circles. The girls showed no objections to the pointless exercises and completed their tasks almost mechanically. Bristol assumed they were trying to avoid attention from the wardens who were patrolling them. The wardens 
wore dark uniforms and kept a hand on the whips dangling from their belts as they supervised the young woman. As if the facility wasn't grim enough, a peculiar contraption in the middle of the property gave Bristol an uneasy feeling in the pit of her stomach. It appeared to be a large stone well, but instead of a water bucket hanging from its roof, there was a thick wooden board with three holes, the perfect sizes to fit around someone's wrists and neck. Well, whatever it was, Bristol hoped she would avoid the me me mechanism during her time at the facility. The carriage stopped at the building's entrance. The driver and guards pulled Bristol out of the back and she shrieked because the air was much colder than she'd anticipated. The front doors slowly opened from inside, the rusty hinges screeching like an animal in pain, and a man and woman stepped outside to greet the newcomers. The man was incredibly short. The man was short and shaped like an upside down pear. He had an incredibly wide head, a very thick neck, and a torso that narrowed as it lowered into his tiny waist. He was a sharp dresser and wore a red bow tie with a blue suit that was perfectly tailored to his awkward measurements. His mouth was curled into a devious grin that never faded. The woman beside him was shaped like a cucumber. She was almost twice as tall as him, and she was the exact same width, width from head to toe. She looked more conservative than the man and wore a black dress with a high lacy collar. A permanent frown was frozen on her face like she had never laughed in her entire life. May we help you? The man asked in a deep raspy voice. Are you Mr. and Mrs. Edgar, the administrators of this, the administrators of this facility? The driver asked. Yes, that's us, the woman said in a sharp, N nasally voice. By order of the High Justice Monteclair of Chariot Hills, Miss Bristol Lynn Evergreen has been sentenced to live at your facility until further noticed, one of the guards informed them. He handed the man a scroll with the official order in writing. Mr. Edgar read over the document and then eyed Bristol like, she, like he had won a prize. My, my, he said. Miss Evergreen must have done something very naughty for a high justice to sentence, her, to sentence her personally. Of course, we would be delighted to have her join us. Then she's all yours, the driver said. The guards lock, unlocked Bristol's shackles and shoved her toward the administrators. Without missing a beat, the guards and the, and the driver returned to the carriage and raced away from the facility. Mr. and Mrs. Edgar looked Bristol up, up and down like two dogs inspecting a stake. Let me the first be the first to warn you, dearie, that this is a house of the Lord, Mrs. Edgar said in a spiteful tone. If you know what's good for you, you'll leave your debauchery at the door. You must be tired and hungry from your journey, Miss Edgar said in a friendly manner that Bristol didn't trust. You're just in luck. It's nearly dinner time. Come inside and we'll get you changed into something more appropriate. So. Mr. Edgar placed a hand on the back of Bristol's neck and the couple escorted her inside. The interior of the Bootstrap Correctional Facility was just as cold and battered as the outside. The floor was made of rotten, rotting wooden planks. The ceiling was stained from leaks and the walls were covered in dents and scrapes. The administrators moved Bristol down a corridor and through a large archway into a spacious dining hall. The dining hall had three long tables that stretched the entire length of the room and a small table at the front of the faculty members. More young women in faded gray and black striped dresses were seated at the long tables, hard at work sewing pieces of leather boots together. Just like the girls outside, the young women in the dining hall were gaunt and looked fatigued. Their fingertips were bruised and bleeding from being forced to work with dull needles. Additional wardens paced the hall as they inspected the girls' work, and they backhanded some of the young women who weren't sewing fast enough to their satisf satisfaction. At the front of the room, hanging above the smaller table, was an enormous banner with a message that made Bristol's blood boil. Good girls do what they told 
they never ask questions. Good girls finish their work. They never take breaks. Good girls keep their heads down. They never look for trouble. Good girls are always truthful. They never tell lies. Good girls know their place. They never show disrespect. Good girls are grateful. They never want more. Before Bristol could comment on the infuriating message, the administrators pushed her up a rickety st staircase at the back of the dining hall. Mrs. Edgar unlocked a heavy bare, bare door and the couple moved Bristol into her office into their office at the top of the stairs. Unlike the rest of the facility, the Edgar's office the Edgar's office was very elegant. It had carpeted floors and a crystal chandelier, and the walls were painted with murals of beautiful landscapes. The office was lo had large windows that peered into the dining hall and the facility ground and the facility's grounds. It was the perfect place to spy on the young woman as they worked. Mr. Edgar took a seat in a leather chair behind a cherry wood desk. Mrs. Edgar pulled Bristol behind a privacy screen in, an, in a corner of the office and had her remove the clothes and shoes she had arrived in. She tossed Bristol's things into a waste basket, basket and crossed to a bulky wardrobe on the other side of the room. The woman opened the drawers and selected a faded gray and black striped dress, a bandana, and a pair of work boots. Here, she said, and handed the items to Bristol. Get dressed. Bristol had nothing to put on but her undergarments and was freezing, so she put the new clothes on as fast as she could. Unfortunately, the uniform wasn't nearly as warm as her old clothes, and Bristol shivered in the cold room. Ma'am, may I please have a sweater, she asked. Does this look like a boutique? Mrs. Edgar snapped. The cold is good for you. It makes you seek the warmth of the Lord. She sat Bristol in the chair across from her husband. His devilish grin grew as, she, as he watched Bristol shiver, and his double chin turned into four. Miss Evergreen, allow me to officially welcome you to the Bootstrap Correctional Facility for Troubled Young Woman, Mr. Edgar said. Do you know why the High Justice has placed you under our care? They say you're supposed to cure me, Bristol said. Indeed, he said. You see, there's something inside of you that shouldn't be there. What may seem like a talent or a gift is actually an illness that must be, that must be rem remedi that must be removed immediately. My wife and I created this facility so we could help girls with your condition. With some hard work and prayer, girls with your, with some hard work and prayer will root out all the unnatural qualities you, all the unnatural qualities you possess. And nothing will prevent you from becoming a respectful, a respectful wife and mother one day. I don't understand how manual labor and, pray and prayer cures anyone, she said. Mr. Edgar let out a low, rattling laugh and shook his head. Our methods may seem tedious and grueling, but they are the most effective tools for treatment, he explained. You are infected with a horrible disease. It's a sickness of the spirit that the Lord himself opposes, and it's going to take time and effort to destroy it. However, with dedication and discipline, we can crush the very source of your symptoms. Our facility will starve the evil from your soul, pop the darkness out of your heart, and drain the wickedness from your mind. Bristol knew it was in her best interest just to say silent and nod, but every word out of Mr. Edgar's mouth infuriated her more than the last. Mr. Edgar, you agree the Lord is all-knowing, all-powerful, and the sole creator of all existence, correct? She asked. Without question, Mr. Edgar replied. Then why would the Lord create magic if he hates it so much? She asked. It's a little counterproductive, don't you think? Mr. Edgar went quiet, and it took him a few moments to answer her. To test the loyalty of your soul, 
Of course, he declared, the Lord wants to separate the people who seek sal salvation from the people who surrender to sin by willingly making sacrifices to overcome your condition. You are proving your devotion to the Lord and to his beloved southern kingdom. But if the Lord wants to identify those who willingly overcome magic, aren't you interfering by forcing young girls to overcome it? Her second question was even more befuddling than the first. Mr. Edgar became flustered and his cheeks turned the same color as his bow tie. His eyes darted between Bristol and his wife as he composed a response. Of course not, he said. Magic is an unholy manipulation of nature. And no one should manipulate the Lord's beautiful world but the Lord himself. He smiled upon the people who try to stop such abom abominations. But you're trying to manipulate me. Isn't that also an abomination? Bristol asked. Mr. and Mrs. Edgar gasped. They had never been accused of such a thing. Bristol knew she should stop while she was ahead, but she couldn't stomach any more hypocrisy. She was going to speak her mind, whether the administrators liked it or not. How dare you, Mr. Edgar exclaimed. My wife and I have devoted our lives to the Lord's work. But what if you're wrong about the Lord, she argued. What if the Lord is much kinder and loving than you are giving him credit for? What if the Lord invented magic so people could help each other and enrich their own lives? What if the Lord thinks you're the unholy ones for abusing people and making them believe their existence is a whack? Mrs. Edgar slapped Russell so hard her whole head jerked in a different direction. You disrespectful little beast, Mrs. Edgar said. You will bite your tongue or I, or I will have it removed. Is that understood? Bristol nodded as blood dripped from the corner of her mouth. Mr. Edgar leaned back in her chair and, and stared at Bristol like she was a wild animal he was excited to tame. You have a long road ahead of you, Miss Evergreen, he said. I'm looking forward to watching your progress. A loud gong sounded through the facility. Ah, time for dinner, Mr. Edgar said. You may join the other girls in the dining hall. Try to get some rest tonight. Tomorrow's going to be a very, very long day for you. Mrs. Edgar raised Bristol to her, into, onto her feet, walked her to the door, and gave her a shove on her way down the rickety staircase. At the announcement of dinner, the young woman so, sewing boots in the dining hall put away their work. The girls fi filed in from outside and joined the others at the tables. Bristol didn't know where to sit, so she took the first empty seat she could find. None of the girls noticed the newcomer in their presence. In fact, none of the girls said a word or shifted their focus from, from whatever was directly ahead of them. Despite Bristol's attempts to introduce herself, the young woman remained silent and still as statues. Mr. and Mrs. Edgar sat in, in throne-like chairs at the faculty table and were joined by the wardens and the hunchback gatekeeper. Once they were seated, a group of young women with aprons over their gray and black striped dresses entered from the kitchen and served the faculty members roasted chicken, mashed potatoes, and baked vegetables. De the delicious aroma reminded Bristol of how hungry she was and her stomach growled like a neglected pet. After faculty plates were full, the young woman were sent table by table to line up at a serving cart for their own supper. Bristol had, had ha was handed a crusty bowl of a chunky brown stew that bubbled and smelled like skunk. It took every ounce of willpower not to gag at the revolting food. She followed the line back to her table, where the young woman stood at their seats until all the girls in the hall were served. While they waited, Bristol's eyes fell on a girl a few seats down from her. She was the smallest girl in the dining hall and couldn't have been older than six or seven years old. She had, been, she had big brown eyes, a tiny button nose, and a very short, choppy haircut. Unlike the others, the little 
girl sensed Bristol's gaze and turned to her. At first, Bristol was taken aback by the acknowledgement and didn't know what to, to do. Hello, she whispered with a smile. What's your name? The little girl didn't respond and just stared at Bristol with blank eyes as if her body was deprived of a soul. My name is Bristol, Bristol said. Today's my first day. How long have you... Their one-sided conversation was interrupted when Mr. Edgar pounded his fist on the faculty table. All the young women had finally returned to their seats, and the administrator rose from his chair to address the room. It's time for the evening prayer, he instructed. Begin. Bristol didn't know the young woman could speak, but to her surprise, they followed Mr. Edgar's command and recited a prayer to perfect unison. To our Lord in heaven, we send our daily thanks for the meal we're about to receive. May it nourish our bodies so we may continue the work of our hands and the work of our hearts. May you bless us with wisdom to recognize our faults, the strength to fix what's broken inside us, and the guidance to stay from our unnatural temptations. In the name of, of the southern kingdom, we pray. Amen. When the prayer was finished, the girls took their seats and devoured the brown stew like they had never eaten before. We still couldn't remember the last time. She was so hungry, but she couldn't even touch the food. The daily blessing had made her too angry to eat. Even in her worst nightmares, she had never imagined a place as terrible as this. And as far as she knew, she would be stuck there for a very, very long time. Bristol's room at the Bootstrap Correctional Facility was, a, was the size of a closet, but that was the least of her worries. Shortly after dinner, two wardens escorted her to the small chamber on the fifth floor and locked her behind its sliding bare doors. As the temperature dropped overnight, Bristol had nothing but a thin and raggedy blanket to keep warm. She had never been so cold in her entire life and shivered so hard her cot was practically vibrating. Her jaw rattled with such intensity, her teeth sounded like a horse's hoofs against the pavement. Around midnight, Bristol was distracted from the cold by the strange sensation of being watched. When she looked up, she was startled to see the little girl with, with the short, choppy hair, hair standing behind the bars of her door. The girl stared at her just as blankly as she had at dinner and carried a folded wool blanket. Um, hello, Bristol said, wondering how long the little girl had been standing there. Can I help you? Pip, she said. Bristol was confused and sat up to get a better look at the odd little girl. Excuse me, she asked. It's Pip, the little girl repeated. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. Bristol apologized. Does that mean something in another language? At dinner, you asked me what my name was, the little girl said. It's Pip. Oh, that's right, Bristol recalled. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Pip. Is there a reason you're giving me your name so late? Pip shrugged. Not really, she said. I just finally remember it. The little girl's distant gaze never changed, but there was an innocent uh, innocence about her, her that Bristol found charming. Do you have a last name, Pip? The little girl looked at the floor and her shoulders sank. Remembering her first name was such a challenge, she hadn't prepared for any more questions. Wait, I do, she said. It's Squeak, Pip Squeak. Pip Squeak? Her soul was surprised to hear. Is that your real name? It's the only name I remember being called, Pip said with a shrug. Then again, I don't have any memories before I lived here. How long have you been here? Bristol asked. About six years, I think. You've been here that long? I was just a toddler when I arrived, Pip said. My parents brought me here as soon as they realized I was different. I started showing signs pretty early. You mean signs of magic? Bristol asked. You were doing magic when you were just a toddler? Mm-hmm, Pip said. Still can, too. Want me to show you? Please, Bristol said without hesitating. The little girl looked up and down the hallway to make sure they were alone. When she'd seen the coast was clear, Pip stretched out her neck and limbs. 
Then she pressed her head against the bare door. Bristle watched in amazement as slowly but surely, the little girl squeezed through the bars like her body was made of clay. When she was on the other side, Pip's body snapped back to its original shape. That's unbelievable, Bristle explained, forgetting to keep her voice down. You've been doing that since you were a baby? I used to squeeze through the railing of my crib. Bristol laughs, laughed. I guess that explains how you are out of your room tonight. I sneak out all the time, Pip said. Oh, that's reminded me. I came to bring you this. I could hear you shivering from my room, so I snuck into the Edgar, Edgar's. I snuck into the Edgar's linen, linen cloth closet to get you an extra blanket. She wrapped a blanket around Bristol's shoulders. Bristol was extremely touched by Pip's gesture, but she was also extremely cold and had no trouble accepting it. That was so kind of you, she said. Are you sure you don't need it? No, I'm used to the cold, Pip said. Although it's been getting a lot colder lately. It usually starts warming up this time of year, but I overheard Mr. Edgar saying there's a really bad blizzard in the Northern Kingdom. We're not too far from the border, so let's hope the storm doesn't get any closer. Yes, let's hope, Bristol said. I don't think I could manage anything colder than this. It rarely snows in Chariot Hills. What's Chariot Hills? Pip asked. Pip asked. Bristol was shocked she had never heard of the city before, but then she reminded herself that Pip didn't even know her real name. It's the city where I'm from, she explained. Oh, Pip said. I'm sorry. I don't get out much. Well, never actually. What's Chariot Hills like? It's big and busy, Bristol described it. There's a town square with a courthouse, a cathedral, and a law university. It's also the capital of the Southern Kingdom and where the king lives with the royal family. You're from the same place as the royal family, Pip asked. How did a girl like you end up here? Same as you, I got caught doing magic. Bristol said. I didn't even know I was capable of magic until a week ago. I found a book called The Truth About Magic in the library I, I worked at. There was an ancient incantation in the book to test whether someone was magic has magic in their blood. I was stupid enough to read it aloud, and now here I am. What happened when you read it? The first time, I covered a room with flowers. The second time, I filled the room with a thousand of lights and made it look, and made it look like the universe. Pip's large eyes grew even larger. That's amazing, she said. I've never met someone who could do anything like that before. Most of the girls just have little tricks like mine. A girl down the hall from my room can grow her hair at will. A girl on the second floor can stand on water without sinking. And I've seen one girl talk to the cows outside, but that might not be magic. She just, she might just be weird. You must be really powerful if you covered a whole room in flowers and lights. Bristol had never thought about it before. You think so? She asked. I've never had anything to compare it to. Your magic is the only magic I've seen besides my own. I'm glad Mr. and Mrs. Edgar haven't drained it out of you yet. Don't worry, their treatments don't actually cure magic, Pip said. The, this facility is, is just a front for the Edgar's family business. It was a regular boot factory before Mr. Edgar inherited it. Hence the name Bootstrap. The only reason he and his wife turned it into a correctional facility was to get free labor out of young girls. At least that's what I heard the gatekeeper say. He's also an aspiring poet, but that's a different story. It's funny how much you learn when no one thinks you're listening. The Edgars are such terrible people, Bristol said, and they have the nerve to say we're the sinful ones. Suddenly, both suddenly, both girls jumped at the sound of footsteps echoing from a few floors below. Who is that? Bristol asked. The wardens are making their nightly rounds, Pip said. I should get back to my room before they reach our floor. Wait, don't forget this. Bristol removed the blanket from her shoulders and tried to hand it back, but Pip wouldn't take it. You can keep it for the night, she said, but I'll have to collect it early in the morning and return it to the closet before Mrs. Edgar wakes up. She caught me sneaking out of my room last week and chopped off all my hair as punishment. If it happens again, they'll put me in the dunker for sure. What's the dunker? 
Bristol's asked. When the girls misbehave, I mean really misbehave, they're strapped to the well outside and dunked in the cold water until Mr. Edgar thinks they've learned their lesson. Sometimes it takes hours. Bristol couldn't believe her ears. This place gets more dreadful by by the minute, she said. How have you how have you survived it for so long? I guess it could be worse, Pip said. How? Oh, I don't actually know how it could be worse, she said. I haven't seen been many I haven't been many places to compare it to. Well, none actually. It's certain the worst place I've ever been to. It's certainly the worst place I've ever been to, Bristol said. But I'm grateful I met I met someone as kind as you. Let's work out of here one day and move someplace warm where we can see the ocean. What do you say? Bristol knew the thought intrigued Pip because the corners of her mouth began to twitch and slowly curved into a smile, possibly the first smile she had ever had. It's a nice thought to fall asleep to, she said. Good night, Bristol. Pip squeezed through the bars and quietly snuck back to her room before the wardens reached the fifth floor. Bristol lay back down on her cot and tried her best to sleep. She was still cold, even with a second blanket, but she shivered a lot less thanks to the warmth of her new friend. Bristol thought working at the library was strenuous, but it was nothing compared to her first days at the Bootstrap Correctional Facility. Every morning at dawn, the wardens unlocked the young woman from their rooms, rushed them through a grotesque breakfast in the dining hall, and then forced them to complete chores until dinner. The tasks were brutal on Bristol's body, and with every passing hour, she didn't know how she would get through the next. But she didn't have a choice. By the end of her first week, her faded gray and black striped dress was much looser than it had been the day she first put it on. The most challenging part of all was keeping the frustration from surfacing on her face. Otherwise, she would meet the wrath of the wardens. Occasionally, Bristol would get the eerie sense that she was being watched by more than just the wardens. She'd look up and see Mr. Edgar glaring down at her from his office, delighted to see how much she was struggling. By the end of the day, Bristol's body ached so much she didn't even notice the freezing temperature. Pip was ki kind enough to sneak her a blanket each night after the Edgars went to bed, and then she promptly returned the blanket the next morning before they woke. Bristol hated that Pip was, ri was risking getting caught for her sake, but their nightly visits were all she had to look forward to. Their daydreams about escaping the facility and moving to the coast were the only thing that kept her going. She didn't know how she would survive without them. One night, Pip didn't show up and Bristol became concerned. Her friend had spent the day digging holes in the yard, so Bristol hoped she was just too tired to sneak out of her room. The following morning, while she waited for breakfast to be served, Bristol's concerns skyrocketed because she didn't see Pip anywhere in the dining hall. She strained her neck, trying to spot her friend's choppy hair among the bandanas, but Pip was gone. Just then, Mr. and Mrs. Edgar emerged from their office, slamming the heavy door behind them. They marched down the rickety steps in a huff, causing the staircase to stay beneath them, and then proceeded to the front of the hall. Breakfast has been canceled this morning, Mr. Edgar announced. Bristol sighed and slumped in her seat. She had become depend dependent on the nauseating meals, but she was the only girl at her table that, who was affected by the news. The others remained as motionless and expressionless as always. Something very troubling occurred late last night, Mr. Edgar went on, when my wife and I slept. The wardens caught a young lady stealing our private property. As you know, thievery is an unforgivable sin in the eyes of the Lord, and it will not be tolerated under this roof. We must make an example out of this thief, so the Lord does not think we've deserted him. Bring her in. 
At his signal, Bristol watched in horror as Bristol watched in horror as the wardens pushed Pip into the dining hall. Her hands were tied behind her back, and her large eyes were more distant than normal, like her mind had abandoned her body out of fear. The wardens moved her to the front of the room beside Mr. Edgar, and the administrator walked in circles around Pip as she as he questioned the small girl. Tell the other girls what you did, he ordered. I I I, I took a blanket from the linen closet, Pip confessed. And why would you do such a thing? Mr. Edgar asked. I I I was cold, she said. Pip looked up, and her eyes immediately found Bristol in the crowd. Watching her friend lie on, on her behalf made Bristol sick to her stomach. She had to do something to save Pip, but she didn't know how to help her. And what do we say about the cold? Mr. Edgar asked. You, you say the cold is good for us, Pip recited. It makes us seek the warmth of the Lord. Precisely, Mr. Edgar said, but you were interested in the warmth of the Lord last night. All you cared about was yourself. So you abandoned the Lord and resorted to sin to, satif to satisfy your physical desires. And what do we do with sinners at this facility? We, we, we cleanse them, Pip said. Exactly, he replied and turned to the rest of the room. To ensure none of you follows in her footsteps, you will join us outside and watch the thief be punished for her shameful actions. Take her to the dunker. The name of the horrible device sparked a wave of fear through the young woman in the dining hall. It was the only reaction Bristol had seen the girl, the girl's house since she had arrived. Their mouths dropped open and they looked to one another with wide, frightful eyes. The wardens grabbed Pip by the arms and headed out of the hall, but Bristol jumped in front of them and blocked their path. Wait, she screamed, this is my fault. Pip did nothing wrong. Stand aside, you reckless little worm, M Mrs. Edgar yelled. This girl was caught red-handed while you were in your room. No, it was me, Bristol declared. I put her under a spell. I bewitched her into stealing the blanket. Punish me and let her go. Liar, Mr. Edgar shouted. No one in this facility has that kind of power. Now stand aside, or you'll... I can prove it, Bristol yelled. El zoon el noon, akel na enama, del noon la noon, akel akam aknamon. The ancient incantation echoed through the dining hall. For a few tense moments, the administrators looked around in terror, but nothing appeared. Bristol wondered if she had mispronounced the text, because the spell was taking longer than it had in the library. Mr. and Mrs. Edgar began to laugh at her attempt to the sidetrack to sidetrack them. You foolish girl, uh, you foolish girl, Mr. Edgar sneered. We will deal with you later. Now wardens take the little one outside and strap her to the, suddenly Mr. Edgar was distracted by screeching. The noise grew louder and louder, like the thunder of an approaching storm to everyone's astonishment a flock of colorful birds burst through the windows and soared into the dining hall causing the room to erupt in panic the birds circled bristol like a tornado and then lunged at the faculty members knocking the wardens and the administrators off their feet next the flock flew to the front of the room and attacked the banner hanging above above the faculty table ripping it apart with their claws and beaks by the time they finished, the banner was almost completely shredded, and only five words of the of the oppressive message remained. Good girls always want more. Once they had finished with the banner, the birds flew out the windows, vanishing as quickly as they had appeared. The dining hall froze for an entire week minute of uninterrupted shock. Finally, the silence was broken when Mr. Edgar let out a mortified scream and pointed to Bristol. Take that heathen to the dunker, he commanded. Before she could fully comprehend what was happening, the warden seized Bristol and dragged her outside. The entire facility followed them to the dunker and gathered around it. The wardens fastened the contraption's wooden board around Bristol's neck and wrists, then hoisted her above the deep well. 
her feet dangling over the icy water. The suspension was incredibly painful and Bristol could barely breathe. Drop her on my signal, Mr. Edgar ordered. One, two. Bristol braced herself to meet the freezing water below, but oddly, Mr. Edgar never gave the wardens his signal. For a second, Bristol thought the flock of birds had returned because Mr. and Mrs. Edgar went stiff and stared into the horizon in bewilderment. Soon the property was filled with the sounds of galloping hooves and all the spectators around the well turned to see what the Edgar Edgars were gawking at. On the outer road, a golden carriage raced toward the facility at an unprecedented Unprecedented, unpredictable speed. It was pulled by four large horses with long magenta manes, but there was no driver steering the magnificent steeds. As the carriage approached, Bristol realized the creatures weren't horses at all, but unicorns with silver horns. The carriage reached the facility, and the gate unlocked and swung open on its own without the help of the gatekeeper. The unicorns slowed down as they trotted through the property and came to a, st to a stop directly in front of the dunker. The carriage door opened and its sole passenger stepped out. She was a beautiful woman with dark hair and bright eyes, and she wore a vibrant purple gown, a, s a stylish fascinator, and one glove on her left arm. The woman observed the facility with a judgmental gaze. So this is where the bloom comes from, she said. No one said a word to the woman. All the faculty members and young woman remained very still, staring at the unicorns in disbelief, like they were all experiencing the same hallucination. Well, you're a talkative bunch, the woman said. Then again, there isn't much to talk about around these parts, is there? Am I right to assume this is a bootstrap correctional facility? And who might you be? Mr. Edgar explained. Oh, forgive my manners, the woman said with a cheerful smile. I'm Madame Weatherberry. I'm looking for Bristol Evergreen.